Uh, today is, uh, you know, start of a new uh, a new era for us. We have uh, obviously a new coach, a new general manager, and we'll have a chance to visit with uh, our new general manager in an hour or so. And uh, but we're thrilled to have Coach Smith with us today. And um, I would say uh, our search was uh, was extensive. Um, I, I think we interviewed maybe seven candidates, maybe more than that. Um, it was uh, it was clear from the outset we went through the process that there were a lot of very qualified coaches this year. Um, you know, I would say the most that I've ever seen personally in the past. Um, and so I'm really happy about that. And I think that's real progress for the league and progress for these, you know, for these young men. Um, and uh, and we're thrilled that we were the number one choice we made was uh, Coach Smith from Tennessee and. Um, and uh, we went through a, a virtual interview with him that was extensive with a lot of reference checking, a lot of uh, a lot of conversations, et cetera. He was kind enough to come to Atlanta. We did an in-person interview as well. Um, he's got a great background, great credentials, uh, had a ton of experience at Tennessee. Um, and I would say this, and, and I don't know whether whether Arthur would agree or not, um, but, you know, the fact that uh, he's been at Tennessee and there's been three three coaching changes there. Um, and in each case, they've chosen not only to keep Coach Smith, but to move him up the pipeline, uh, move him up the ladder in terms of his responsibility is, is probably a record in the NFL for 101 years. That very rarely happens. It's not often that coaching staffs, even selectively, are, are retained. Sometimes it happens, but usually not. But you go through three iterations of coaching changes and to have Coach Smith, in each case, uh, be asked to not only stay on, but to take on additional responsibility, I think speaks well for, uh, you know, for himself. Um, and so, we're, you know, we're excited about that. Um, and I think particularly we're excited about what he's done with the offense in the last two years in Tennessee. And you guys will have plenty of opportunity to ask him all the questions you would like to. This is not really, I'll ask, I'll answer the questions I can and I should, but it's really about you getting to know our new coach. Um, but we're extraordinarily excited uh, to have him in Atlanta. And um, and so with that, let me uh, just open it up to questions you might have for me. Um, it doesn't mean if you ask me a question, you can't ask him the same question. He'll obviously hear my answer, which may or may not bias him. Probably not. Um, he's got great. I would I would say this. He, uh, the, the, all, on all the references that we got, um, there are a couple of things that came out very consistently. Uh, extraordinarily um, hardworking, uh, great humility. Uh, cares deeply about uh, the players, uh, has always put players um, in a position to win, whatever their position may be on the field, a little bit of defense. His background, as you know, is, a, is an offensive guard at UNC. Uh, but he's had some work on the defensive side of the ball in addition to the, uh, all the offensive work he's had. Um, so the humility was another factor that we heard uh, consistently. Um, uh, strong, uh, strong with the players when necessary, but fair and balanced. But uh, he definitely has great humility, which uh, speaks well for, for him. Um, and the other thing, I'll give you an example. I, this this I can share with you because I think it's not, you know, I don't think uh, I think Coach Gibbs would be fine with it. I got a text yesterday from Coach Gibbs, uh, Joe Gibbs. And Joe uh, had uh, Coach Smith on his staff. Trying to think of the years, it was 2006, uh, I'm sorry, seven, eight, and nine when Coach uh, Gibbs was in Washington. And, you know, and I've got a relationship with Joe. We'd actually, we didn't call him for any references, but he texted me yesterday and said, I just want you to know that this young man, uh, who I had in the very early stages of his NFL career, uh, did a superlative job for me. Uh, I always thought he was going to go places in the league, uh, he was always hardworking. Um, very thoughtful, bright, um, always, always was helpful to me. And so, you know, I mean, that wasn't solicited. I didn't call Joe and ask him or anything, et cetera, but I have a relationship with him, but it was nice to hear that from a Hall of Fame coach as well. So um, with that, let me, uh, let me turn it over to your questions and uh, we'll get through those as soon as you would like. And then uh, we'll get on to the uh the uh, important part of the, today's press conference, which is you all having a chance to meet Coach Smith and, and our fans having a chance to meet Coach Smith as well. So with that, David, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, all right. Uh, initial questions for uh, Arthur Blank. d uh, Yes, Arthur. Um, 
what's the new structure now with your, your new uh, GM and, and coach now and who has control of the roster and, and everything? Because we had the co-team builders last time around. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, it's it's similar in that regard. I think both uh, uh, Terry and Arthur will both report directly to Rich McKay. Um, I will say this, they both view that as a, uh, and you can ask them specifically, but they both made a point of saying they view that as a real plus in our situation. They both viewed Rich as somebody who's a, a experienced NFL uh, executive who's been a general manager, been around the league for, you know, 25 years or longer, probably 27 years or so. Um, somebody who's connected to the league uh, through the competition committee and a variety of other things. So, you know, they view that as, as a resource that they wouldn't ordinarily have. And I think for whether it be a first time head coach or a first time general manager, I think that's important. Um, so uh, I, that so that that structure will exist. Um, I think the beauty of their relationship and they can describe it to you themselves and let Arthur talk about it. But um, Terry and Arthur really didn't know each other. Um, they hadn't worked. Hadn't worked together. Uh, the, one of our candidates was a, a young man, very qualified, who had worked with Terry in the Saints for two years, Joe, Joe Brady, and um, and yet, you know, I mean, Terry reached out, developed a relationship with Arthur, uh, felt very strongly that, that was the, that was the right choice for us, uh, had, had done his homework, and et cetera. So, I think the beauty of both of them is that whether it's 53 or 48 or 48 or 53 or whatever numbers you want to throw around. I think they both would give you the same answer, and that is that who has what, you know, is is kind of secondary. Somebody will have the 53, somebody will have the 48, but it's really not really not terribly important because they both they both see the world of football through the same eyes, the same vision, and I think that means that you know they, they, if it comes down to the 53 or the 48, usually it means um, that you probably keep digging and try to find another answer. Um, as opposed to saying, well, I have the 53 or I have the 48. So um, I think, R R Rich, are you on the call now? Okay. I am, Arthur. I am. Okay. And, and you explained it right. I mean, we, we tried to set it up in a way that they, uh, they it was collaborative. That was kind of what we talked about from the very beginning. I think that's Arthur's vision. Yeah. I should say Arthur, Coach Smith's vision, and that is uh, Terry's vision. And that was what was talked about. And to, to Mr. Blank's point, I think when we interviewed Terry, we brought up coaches. First name he brought up was Arthur Smith. When we interviewed Arthur, we brought up GM candidates. First name he brought up was Terry Fontenot. So that was a good thing for us. Yeah. So I, I to answer your question, and again, you, you can ask um, you know, the other author that same question. But I think what you'll hear is that um, the structure itself, uh, they'll work together very closely. And hopefully they'll see the world the same way. And for my second question, um, in this tough, in these two tough start searches, uh, what stood out about both of the candidates that lifted them above the, the the seven and the five people that you all interviewed? Yeah. Well, I think it's a variety of things. For, first of all, I would say this was. I think both uh, both decisions were. Uh, were challenging for us, uh, which doesn't take away for one minute of the two that we did select, you know, Terry and Arthur. But I would say that it speaks well, I think, for where the NFL is and where the candidate pool is, is coming and growing. Uh, okay. There were a lot of very qualified people this year. Um, but I think with, uh, in, my, in my view, in terms of Coach Smith, I think um, it's, it's care about, you know, humility, love, leader. Players love him. Uh, very creative. Um, it's produced at a high level in Tennessee. Uh, has has adopted um, an offense in Tennessee around those around their players, um, around who they have. In this case, are an outstanding running back and a quarterback who was frankly didn't have a great career before he came to Tennessee. And I think I give Coach Smith a lot of credit for that, along with the young man Ryan Tannehill. Um, for being able to produce at that level. The same thing with really with Derrick Henry. Derrick was not Derrick Henry uh, for a number of years in the league until until uh, he was coordinated by um, uh, by Arthur Smith. So, um, you know, I felt all those factors were really important uh, to us. Um, the fact that he was creative, staying ahead of the curve in terms of what's happening in the NFL. You know, some leaders have the ability to see around corners. And I think it's it's important. Not everybody can do that. 
Um, I think that Coach Smith has done that, has shown the evidence of that. I think his offense has been uh, a leading one. Um, I think he's prepared to make a, adjustments to it based on the players that he has. Uh, we have talked about um, our roster, and he'll respond to the questions you all have about that and how he plans on using you know, the roster that we have and the skill positions that we have. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with adjusting an emphasis, more emphasis in the future on the running game than we currently have had. So, um, I think that's true for Arthur. I think with Terry, uh, you know, spent that many years, I think it's 16 years or 17 years in the Saints organization. Obviously they've, they've produced at a very high level over that period of time. Uh, he's been in the middle of all that, both on the pro side and more recently on the college side as well. And later this afternoon, Terry will respond to those, to those questions. He's worked hand in glove with Sean Payton. Um, we actually, I had actually had a phone call last night from their, their general manager, um, you know, wanted to congratulate us on the selection of Terry and that, you know, he was going to be, you know, he felt, he felt badly one because he's a very capable guy and was going to stay in our division, but, um, you know, that is what it is. But, but beyond that, um, he, uh, he was really very excited for him. And, um, he had worked very closely with Sean Payton, who is, you know, a, an outstanding coach. Uh, I'd also say a very demanding coach. I don't think Sean Payton would say anything less than that and demands excellence out of the entire organization. So that kind of training, I think, is important. Um, we don't view, you know, I mean, I think Coach Smith and, and Coach Payton would, are, are different people. But, you know, you want somebody who's, who's worked, you know, um, you know, has had his hand, hand on the anvil. And has had to work in a you know an intense situation. I think Terry's done that. His ability uh, on the pro side and extend influencing the college side has been outstanding. They've done a great job at building their roster over the years uh, during free agency and and uh, in a variety of ways to recruit players and with players that have later later turned out to be you know uh, performing at a Pro Bowl level. Uh, so you know we we like and his ability to you know, have a vision over the whole department and his experience over that period of time. So I, I think we, you know, I, I feel very good and our fans should be feel very good about the choices that we made really in their behalf. Charles Odom, Associated Press. For Mr. Blank, um, I, um, no, Obviously, you, you've made history with your with your um, so, hiring of, of of Terry Fontenot, and and I know that you have <clears throat> another session planned for that. But in speaking of that, the, uh, the diversity of know, hires of head coaches, career, how important was it for you in your search for uh, for a coach uh, to consider minority candidates? And do you have any concern that there's not been more diversity in the five that have been hired by the NFL so far? Well, Charles, it's a you know it's a really good question, and I would say that um, particularly coming on the heels of um, Monday was M MLK Day and what have you. Those those thoughts are with us, you know, throughout the year, and certainly coming out of out of Monday as well. Um, in my opinion, I think the diversity of the pool of candidates, both for general managers and head coaches this year, was excellent. I also think for coordinators, and. Um, I think Coach Smith can speak to that in some detail. Rich can as well. But I, I, I think what you'll see there were a number of coordinators that um, are diverse candidates that that I think will probably not get opportunities this year, but will definitely be getting opportunities in the future. The very wide range of diverse candidates we see in that regard. And I think the fact that you have two general managers here in Atlanta and in um, and in Detroit, uh, young man we interviewed there, Brad Holmes as well both diverse candidates, um, that's, you know, that's really important because we haven't had that diversity at the general manager position. And um, if you look at the history of the NFL, you know, often, uh, you know, more often than we even like, but coach changes are made and GM, GM uh, changes are not made as frequently. So I think that, you know, that these young men and other men in the future will have an opportunity to uh, be part of the hiring cycle for other coaches, I think that which will I think help the issue of looking at diverse candidates in a fair and and, uh, and balanced way. Um, and I and I think uh, every team has to speak for itself. I think we uh, we interviewed a wide variety of very very capable candidates, and we just felt for us at this point in time that Coach Smith was the best choice for us, and we felt that 
uh, Terry Fontenot as a general manager was the best choice for us. It wasn't really based on diversity per se. It was based on who was the most qualified, but we did have a great slate of diverse candidates. And I think I and I think that with these GM choices and you got one head coach who was um, who was uh, selected by the Jets uh, to be their their head coach is a, is a diverse candidate, and there are still two other teams that are that are in the discussion stages, and um, and we'll see where they end up. But I, I am encouraged by the pipeline of the coordinators, um, and not only the coordinators, but you know number of quarterback coaches and and such that I think will create a bigger pool in the future. All right, we got one more for Arthur Blank from Steve Hummer. And then, Arthur, if you want to introduce Arthur Smith after that. I've already done that. He's ready to roll. <laughs> Coach Smith yeah. is ready to roll. Good, Steve, where are you? I can't yeah, see I'm you. right here, Arthur. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, uh, a little bit off, off the beaten track here, but have you? Uh, do you know Arthur's father very well? And uh, I suppose, if, if so, you got a re good recommendation from him. Yeah, well, actually, I don't know his dad at all. I've never met his father. Um, I, I did find out during the second interview process that Coach Smith had read read my book when we just published Good Company. And um, and I, I don't know if his dad had read it or not, but his dad knew of me um, and uh, and said some kind things about me. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I did. I was interesting. My son, son Joshua, works at the NFL office in New York, and um, he uh, happened to run into Roger Goodell. Uh, after we made our selection and the commissioner uh, said to Josh, he said, you know, I want you to know that, you know, uh, the young man that you're hiring is terrific. He's outstanding. Comes from a great family, et cetera, et cetera. I know his father well. And, um, and you know, his father and I have a really good relationship, which is nice to hear. I will say this, and this is just my view, um, and you're welcome to speak to Coach Smith about it. But, I mean, obviously he's very proud of what his father did, you know, founder of a great international company and um, has you know great track record, great set of values, et cetera. Um, but I think that the fact that he has access to his father, and not just as a father, but as a counselor um, and getting advice and counsel from him over the years, you know, from an organizational standpoint, you know, dad, how do we do this? How do we do this? When you have somebody that's, you know, d disconnected, how do we bring them back in the fold? I mean, there's a variety of things I know with my children that I've been able to share with them over the years that I, I hope God willing, that'll be helpful to them in their careers. So I'm sure that Fred has done that with Arthur. Um, that's the feeling I have. He's done that with him. So I think that's an advantage. It's not the reason we hired him, um, but, but it is an advantage I think for him personally. And I think he's taken advantage of that, which speaks well for him, speaks well for his dad and speaks well for their relationship. But I'm looking forward to meeting his father. Uh, I, do, I do. I do know when I chatted with Arthur, uh, he said, well, you know, my family is going to be close and just make sure we have several suites available at the stadium for them. So uh, I'm not sure for who in the family is for. Maybe he'll describe that. But uh, he's got a great relationship with his family. And that's uh, and that's important. It's important to all of us because, you know, our, our culture and our relationships with each other, um, it, it's not just about winning, but, you know, how we win. And um, it is about winning. I get it. I understand that. But it's how we win as well. And I think that Coach Smith is going to help uh, make sure that happens the right way. But that's a good question, Steve. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Mike. All right. So with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Arthur Smith. Coach? Hey, <clears throat> how are you doing? I just want to thank Arthur Blank, Rich McKay, and the whole Falcons organization for providing me this opportunity to be the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. It's an unbelievable opportunity and a, and a dream come true. I also want to thank my wife, Allison, my kids, Tanner, Sophie, and Liam, the sacrifices they've made to allow me to do this job and get to this point, and thank my entire family. I've got a large family. I grew up one of 10. I've got a million cousins, nieces, and nephews, and the support they've given me. I do, I do find a little bit of fate that kind of led me to Atlanta as we go along this football journey. Uh, there was an Atlanta native and a great character in college football named Pepper Rogers. And some of you guys may be more familiar than others with him. You know, he was a great player at Georgia Tech, and obviously he was the head coach at Georgia Tech at one point. But Pepper, when I grew up, it was around Memphis. He was a good friend of my father's. And I had the opportunity to, you know, start playing football at nine years old, fell in love with the game, gave me an identity 
And as Tupper was around and we, we attended a lot of these Orange Bowls, which is, which is an unbelievable uh, thing that I was able to do growing up and kind of taught me about the game. My love of the game was built there. And Pepper told me the history of the game and the stories, and he had a huge impact that, that got my interest peaked as a player and then ultimately led to me coach. And I just wanted to bring that up because I was thinking about Pepper today. And then when I started playing football nine years old in the county leagues in Memphis, I had so many coaches that had a huge impact that kind of inspired me. And I'm not going to start naming names because I don't want to leave out anybody. And then the same thing when I was at high school at Georgetown Prep and the University of North Carolina. And then obviously when I started my coaching career at North Carolina and to Washington, to Ole Miss and to Tennessee. I can't thank all the coaches, teammates I've had over the years, the players, and everybody that had an impact on me that allowed me to get to this spot where I am today. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to be the coach here. I'm excited to work with Terry Fontenot and to have a collaborative effort, effort to build this franchise and this football team going forward 2021 and beyond. And so with that, I'd like to open up the questions. All right, dear Orlando Ledbetter, AJC. Uh, yes, Coach Smith, welcome to town. Um, would I, we know we, we've been able to see your offense, but defensively, what do you all want to do scheme-wise, and uh, how are you in your search for uh, filling out your staff and so forth? Yes, we're still in the process. Uh, you know, we, we will take our time. You know, we've we've interviewed multiple uh, people for coordinator spots and staff, and then, like I said, we, we will take our time. And we know we want to be adaptable that'll be a big thing here we'll play to the strengths of our team but we want to be flexible and adaptable so that's one thing we're, we are looking for schematically and uh, as we get through this process of hiring coaches yes and uh with that have you been able to or, or will you undertake a roster evaluation well we're still early in that process you know uh the biggest thing for me you know last season was being the coordinator of tennessee titans and that's where i went all in and then obviously through the interview process as we're getting in here in a couple of days, it'll be an ongoing evaluation. Uh, there's nothing that we'll do, it'll just be a snap judgment. We'll be thorough. And so we're still early in that process. Tori McElhaney from The Athletic. Hello, Coach. Um, welcome to Atlanta. Uh, I, I wanted to ask first off, going back to what Arthur Blank was talking about, uh, in terms of you hadn't known Terry Fontenot, can you kind of speak to the relationship that y'all have developed relatively quickly and how you feel you can work with him? Sure. You know, Terry's got a great reputation. I didn't know Terry personally until this interview process started and Terry and I started talking and and we shared the same values and that's big. And it's the same values that I believe we all share with the Atlanta Falcons and that's huge. And, and I can't wait to work with Terry, you know, as we build it as day one, like any relationship, they'll grow, but it'll be a very collaborative effort. And I, and I can't say enough good things about Terry and the reputation that he has. Uh, my second question, how do you see the careers of Matt Ryan and Julio Jones playing into your offense and your evaluation of what you've seen the Atlanta Falcons do over the last year? Sure. It, it, but it's, it's more than Matt and Julio. I mean, you, you, there's a lot of talented players in this roster. And, you know, whether you're talking about Chris Lindstrom, Grady Jarrett, I mean, there's so many players that we, we're just still early in this process if we fill it out. I mean, it, the roster today is going to look different from to September. And then as you get to week 17, it's a constant evolution. There's a lot of talent here that we'll, we want to build off of. But I, I can't give you any snap judgments today because we're still early in this process. Zach Klein, WSB. Hey coach, welcome to Atlanta. Uh, I was just curious of your views of the team from afar um, and, and what's needed to get this team back in the playoffs. Well, I mean, views from afar, you know, we didn't play the Falcons this year. We put them two years ago, but the, my concern is 2021 and beyond. You know, I, like I said, I was concerned with the, the Titans and the Titans offense last year. And as we're going forward, the only thing that matters is us going forward and how we build this thing out. Because as you guys know, things change week to week, year to year. And the only thing we're looking is going forward. And secondly, with the with the combine this year going virtual, uh, who do you rely on um, staff wise to help you with this process, knowing that you can't see your first ever draft class in person for workouts? Well, I mean, the first thing is we're going to ask our players to be flexible and adapt. And certainly I've got to be adaptable. So everybody's going to play by the same set of rules and we've got to be smart, and creative and, and adaptive. This is what the circumstances are. I and mean, we're going through a hundred year pandemic and here we are. And, and so. If we got to go by Zoom with workouts, that's what we'll do. And we rely on everybody. There's great 
personnel people here, Terry will, you know, as he fills out his staff or, you know, the collaborative effort there, we'll find a way, I promise you that, but everybody will be involved in it. Jason Butt from the AJC. Hey coach, um, just, you know, in general, when it comes to your offensive line, you know, what, what is your philosophy of that unit um, to get things going up front? Well, we'll have a certain standard we want to play. We certainly want, we're going to play physical and we're going to play with great effort. And I know a lot of people say that, but that's will be our hallmark. And again, we'll, we'll adapt to the personnel we have. I and mean, you're always de constantly dealing with different injuries and circumstances that pop up. But we'll have a standard for those guys and we'll be flexible and we'll adapt to whoever's there. You know, and um, when you were back at Georgetown Prep, how, what was, how did you come up with your system of, uh, Mar I believe it was Marvel superheroes to uh, do the plays within the plays there on the offensive line with your, with your good buddy, John Tobacco? <laughs> Well, you know, actually, I, I it, talk about my family. Uh, my older brother, he still is, uh, is, a, is a Marvel fanatic. Um, and so I just, it, he always said, I, I wasn't a big comic book reader, but he was, and it was just easy to use that. And I've always, I still use that, you know, stuff like that to try to be creative in our teaching. As we've used it with the players last year. You can ask some of those guys and analogies, but that's funny. That's, that's a good research you did there, Jason. Thanks. Charles Olam, AP. I wanted to ask about uh, you, you being your, in your first experience as a head coach. Do you have any uh, apprehension about entering uh, a, a new realm as your first time experience as a head coach? And, and can you talk about those you've coached under and who you've learned from and maybe give an example of something you may have learned, for instance, from, from Coach Gibbs? Well, there's a, there's a lot of things. You know, obviously, any job you take, I mean, we, we all take those risks and I'm excited and, you know, there's always unknown and it, but it's constant, you know, I don't want to be the same coach today that I am in 2022 and 2023. We're constant trying to improve and grow in this job. Um, so and then going back to your question with the head coaches, uh, I've learned from every every coach I played under. Uh, that's all I was always trying to listen more than talk. But uh, Coach Gibbs has had a huge impact and has really had a bigger impact since I've stopped working for him over the years. He's been a great mentor to me, a lot of great lessons learned. Uh, some of those are more private than others, and, and schematically, he had an impact on some of the ways that I maybe wanted to attack the playoffs, and that was beneficial to me. Uh, but he's been an, he's had enormous impact, and all these guys have. And I just, you know, I start naming names, it's like leaving out some of your brothers and sisters, and I'm conscious of that because I do have such a large family. Kelsey Conway, AtlantaFalcons.com. Hey, Coach, when you're looking at the two years you were the offensive coordinator of the Titans, you had the league's leading rusher in Derrick Henry, but you were also really good in the red zone. Over those two years, what are some of the keys you've learned to being successful in those areas? Well, sure. It certainly is, is doing the more practical thing, playing to the strengths of your players. Uh, obviously, you know, we had Derrick Henry in Tennessee. There's only one Derrick Henry. I certainly don't think we're just going to go find the next Derrick Henry. We'll adapt to the players we have here in Atlanta and the ones we add to the roster. Uh, and then Ryan was very decisive down the red zone. We had a lot of guys that could make plays hit you from. So we just tried to use the full force of our offense. Uh, we didn't want to be an isolation football team. The credit goes to those guys. And we had a lot of guys make a lot of plays for us. And then and obviously, as you look to fill out your staff, how important will the offensive coordinator role be given that you called the plays last year and assumedly will be doing so? Yeah, it's huge. Any any coach we bring in here, they're going to have to have the same. First off, they're going to have to be great coaches and great people, and they're going to have the same same set of values. We don't want groupthink. That's why we're taking our time as we go through it, and and we've gone through a huge list already, and we'll continue to do that with a diverse set of candidates and, and guys with diversity of thought as well. Um, but yeah, those those hires are, are very important. Um, so we're just trying to make sure we make the right ones. Alex Glaze, Eleven Alive. Hey, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Uh, this is for, for Arthur Smith. Just if you could peel back the, the curtain a little bit um, and just kind of let us know just how much of your your interview or your, your pitch was about um, working with players that are already here, how much was focused on the future, just kind of what was, what was that conversation like? It was about both. It was about having a short-term plan and a long-term plan. 
And that's what it is. Uh, you know, you, you made grand statements right now. I mean, it just, there's so many things that could happen before we ever kick off week one. But you got to have a short-term plan, and you certainly have to have a long-term plan. And it all factors into it. And just kind of as a, as a follow-up for that, I know you already got asked about Matt Ryan and Julio Jones, but just specifically, I want to ask about Matt Ryan because, you, you know, you have the fourth pick. You know, a lot of people see that quarterback, you know, which is kind of how much have you thought about that, and where do you see Matt Ryan working in next year with the Falcons? Well, we, we got a long way to the draft, uh, just like with anybody on our roster. I mean, you know, I'll be evaluated. Yeah, I got to earn my job every day. So we're excited about players that we have, and we, we want to obviously go through the whole thing. But to give you – I can't make a statement today because we we're, there's a long process ahead of us as we evaluate this roster, Terry and I and, and everybody that's going to be involved in decision-making. But Matt, Matt Ryan, has it, it's been a terrific quarterback, and, and I got all, all the respect in the world for Matt Ryan. And I look forward to working with him. Will McFadden, AtlantaFalcons.com. Hey, Coach. Uh, welcome to Atlanta. Um, you've kind of alluded to this, I guess, in bits and pieces. But what kind of identity do you really want to build with this team uh, here in Atlanta? Yeah, well, certainly we, we want to be great up front. We want to have a fast team. And we certainly want to be physical on both sides of the ball. We want to have guys that are great teammates. We're going to hold our best players accountable. And that, that's what it is. We're going to Drop the entitlement, not that to say it was here, but that'll be a, a, a big message in the locker room. And we want to be adaptable because the things change. I mean, you know, where you're drafting from changes year to year. How you, you know, adding pieces here, there in free agency, and you got to be flexible. So we want guys that are adaptable, and especially from week to week, how we got to go play the game to win. And then, you know, Mr. Blank said that you guys were obviously, or you were obviously their number one uh, choice, but you interviewed with a bunch of teams. What was it about the Falcons that attracted you to them? It was several factors. It was the way it was structured from Arthur Blank down to Rich McKay and the way this organization, it's one of the premier organizations in sports. It's first class in every, every aspect. So, it, you know, it, it was helpful to go around and, and, and see how other people did it. But I was strong conviction. I was thankful that they offered me the job and, and happy to be here. To Ron Davenport, ESPN. Coach Art, congrats on this. Uh, you know, I'm going to hate to to not have you here in Nashville, yeah. but that being said, what are some of the things that you learned so much from Mike Vrabel to help prepare you for this this opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I can't thank Mike Vrabel enough for having the faith in me to give me the shot to be the play caller. Uh, you know, Mike Vrabel, he holds it, every player on that roster accountable. And there's a lot of great leadership lessons I learned from, from Mike. He was uh, very flexible with things we did. I'll miss that relationship a lot. He had a huge impact on my career. Um, but yeah, I mean, there. But I'm not Mike Vrabel, you know, the same thing we'll tell our players. You got to be yourself. I'll be myself. There's a lot of lessons learned from very good coaches I've been around. Uh, but, yeah, there's only one Mike Vrabel, and I don't I don't think I, I can have the same uh, temperament he does and, and the ability he has at practice to get one one group and go right into it to the next. So. And then to follow that up, you've seen multiple coaches install their culture and establish that. So for you, what will be the key to doing that successfully and immediately? Because, you know, NFL, not for long. That's that's how it works. So I'm sure, sure. you want to hit the ground running. Sure. That'll be the message early on, you know, what we're, what the expectations are and how we're going to hold guys accountable. And But, you know, you don't come in here day one. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, anything good is a foundation you got to build day by day and, and you know, that meeting team, you know, we, the first meeting we have, depending on what the league rules are in the spring, that's, that's a slow build as we go, go through it, building up to the season. Michael Cunningham, AJC. Yes, Coach. Uh, <clears throat> with Tennessee, uh, one of the, I guess the foundations of your offense was a wide zone with the, with the play actions and the bootlegs. I assume you're going to stick with that philosophy. Could you please just explain what you believe are the, are the strengths of that approach? Well, you know, we, we also ran a decent amount of uh, gap schemes, too. We, we were flexible. We certainly, you know, had a wide zone foundation, but we, we adapted. You know, I think that's a lot of times that there's a lot of mythology to it that people just because they come from one system. But if you look around, it's a, there's a natural evolution, whether you look at what's going on in San Francisco to the L.A. Rams, to the Green Bay Packers. And there's more teams that run it. I just go on the connections there. But we, we certainly adapted to Tennessee. We were, we were good with our foundation. Uh, when we were a little bit bigger in other spots, I think that the evidence would show we, we did adapt to those, you know, whether it was the wideouts or certainly Derek. And uh, we'll continue to do the same here, same thing here in Atlanta. Thank you. 
Jeff Schultz, The Athletic. Hey, Arthur. Um, you said earlier that you don't want groupthink. You want a diversity of thought. Could you expand on that a little bit? And and adding to that, you've you've obviously worked for a lot of head coaches. Um, without necessarily saying what you took from each one, what have you learned in terms of what it takes to be a successful head coach and have a successful staff? Well, sure. I, I think that the worst thing you can do is to go hire a bunch of yes men on a staff. You want guys with experience. You want young guys. You want creative guys. You, you want to share the same values, but you, you've you got to challenge each other. I think there's, you know, the best thing that happens sometimes is, is there is fair criticism and you've got to constantly evaluate. And that's a challenge as a head coach to make sure you're getting the right information to you. People are telling you what's really going on. It's like that happens a lot of times in different leadership structures. So that's one thing. And we want creative and we want an environment where we're able to sustain success with the multiple coaches here. And then you go back to, to about how to how to lead. I mean, there, I've taken leadership lessons from a lot of different businesses and a lot of different love reading about history. And then certainly my work with different head coaches. And then they said, you know, we, we mentioned Joe Gibbs and, and Joe Gibbs won three Super Bowls and did it with three different quarterbacks. There are certain things that, I, you know, I didn't realize at the time, but looking back about how he went about how he managed the team on a day to day basis. And there's a lot of coaches that, that I've learned from. But it, the consistent message is, is, is that work it's, is a long, hard road and it's day after day being consistent. That's ironically the most consistent message I can give you what I learned from those guys. It, and does the follow-up, does it, you've been on both good teams and bad teams. Obviously, you've been in the league for a while. Does it take a while in the NFL to turn things around, whether it's schematically, whether it's philosophy, whether it's, you know, just attitude? Um, and so as you look at the Falcons, the team obviously that has missed the playoffs the last few years, you know, what should your message be in terms of how long this this can take to turn around? I'm not going to give predictions because every circumstance is so different. Every every year there's different. I mean, certainly we we all need good players. I mean, that that's that's the beauty of the NFL. That what's that's what I love about it because there is a lot of parity and there's a lot of strategy involved in in building the rosters and when you have to adapt to to injuries. Uh, but it's hard for me to compare. That's one thing you you'll, you'll learn from me. I'm not going to compare players. I just it works for some people. I don't because I think we're all different and I think every team that we're going to coach. 2021 team will be different from the 2022 team. There's a different set of issues everywhere. Um, so it's, that's just kind of my philosophy on there. Steve Hummer from the AJC. Yeah, hi, Coach. Uh, I don't know if it's if possible in a in a summary, but uh, what most, I, I guess, about your father's examples helped get you to where you are now? Well, first thing I'll say, one thing I just make clear, like just – because of my father is I've never mistaken his his success for my success. And I've said that before, and I wholeheartedly believe that he didn't he didn't push that on any any of, of his kids. And I, I was fortunate enough, you know, obviously you don't realize it growing up. Nobody knows, you know, we're all born in different circumstances and that's what it is. But I had great parents, both my mom and dad, that instilled great values in us, about hard work, compassion. And, you know, we we're fortunate enough. I mean, I obviously didn't realize as a little kid who my my dad was, didn't think, and I certainly don't think I'm special. He doesn't think he's special. But just like every resource that we'll have here in Atlanta, I, I, you know, I'll use them all. And my dad, as we've gotten older, has provided me great lessons in management, leadership, leadership, strategy. And he's been a great father and a, and a father that I want to be to my kids as well. And as as you're coming up in, uh, in this profession, uh, I don't know, in any strange way, does your back, did your background uh, – almost work against you? Did you always have to prove that you were really interested in this football thing when you had so many other options in life? Well, I don't know. Maybe in some ways it probably helped. Maybe it lowered expectations. I don't know. It, uh, you'd have to ask those people around me. I never knew any way just to try to work hard and do a good job at the job they gave me. Jay Black, WSB Radio. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. He, Steve cut off. I couldn't hear what he said. I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. I apologize. Yeah, uh, Steve. Steve was cut off. I mean, he was. At, he had another follow-on question. I think. Well, no. I, 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 the better way to ask that would probably be as you were coming up. How often? How often were you asked how important is football to you? And uh, given your background, and uh, yeah. was that a was that an issue? I don't think everything's an issue. I mean, you know, I'm on. I don't get offended by anything. It just made me want to go prove it long. It maybe it gave me a little bit of chip on my shoulder, and that's what I love about the game of football. There's results. That's why that's what attracted me to this game. One, it gives it gives you an identity. There's no there's no uh, sport like it 
you talk about diversity and, and, and people in different backgrounds. I mean, look at professional football. It's different than any other pro sport, uh, you know, and it let me see the world and definitely it's a different light. And you had to go out there and prove it. It didn't matter if your dad was a CEO or you're from Pomona, California. You get on that football field, you got to go prove it. And uh, that's what's always attracted to me. And that's what is a results driven business. And I want to be judged by that. Jay Black, WSB Radio. I just want to know what your pitch was to Arthur Blank. Why did you think you're the man for the job? Well, I was very confident in what we had done, but I thought it was it was a great fit. It was first off, it was unbelievable to be in this get this opportunity to sit in front of him and and to Rich McKay and then present myself why I could be a head coach. You know, using my history of what I've done as a as a coach in different backgrounds and different aspects of the entire team, not just the offense. My philosophical beliefs and and how to build a how to build a team and how to coach a team. Those are all I presented to him. So it, again, it's just. It's like taking the SAT. I mean, it was, it's great for a number, but just look at the body of work. And that's what I, I wanted to present to them was, here's my body of work. Here's what I've done in my history uh, throughout, throughout the game. So that's what I presented to them. And uh, outside of football, how much time have you spent in Atlanta and what do you think of the city? Well, I love Atlanta. I mean, that's what I said. It's like a dream come true. You talk about fit. You know, I grew up in Memphis, uh, went to high school and I lived in DC and then I went to Chapel Hill spent a year in Oxford, Mississippi, and then in Nashville. So I've been all around up and down the East Coast and definitely in the Southeast. And uh, being from Memphis, you know, it's there's a similar uh, feel to it in terms of hospitality. And you know, Atlanta is obviously different. It's a bigger city and it's got a great history. And we're, we're just, my family and I are excited to be part of this community. All right, we got time for follow-ups. Reminder, if you have a follow-up, uh, just type that in the chat. Jason Butt from AJC. Hey, Coach. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, the beginning when you, you mentioned Pepper Rogers. Um, you know, why is uh, the history of the game so important to you, and how has learning the history of the game helped shape you as a coach? Well, just been history in general. I I, I love history. It, 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 there's a lot of lessons. You know, somebody said they, life's just the same stories endlessly repeated. So you go and study history, and uh, you know the history of the game. I mean, it's it's just my love of that. It brought it to me, and Pepper was is, is if anybody in here is. It, talked to him or knew from you know covering the Atlanta area. He was a great storyteller. I've always been fascinated by great storytellers. And he was a character and uh, just loved listening to it. That's what I grew up to. Maybe there's a nostalgia to it, just thinking back on it. But Zach Klein, WSB. Hey, Coach, have you hired anybody uh, for your staff and uh, any current or last year's coaches uh, you'll be talking with to possibly join? Yeah, we'll talk. There's, there's a certain number of guys we'll talk to. We haven't made any hires yet. You know, we're, we're getting close, probably on a few. But again, we're going to be very thorough about this. We're just like I, I told earlier with Terry and I, there's going to be no snap judges made. And we want to be thorough. We want to get it right. Jeff Schultz, The Athletic. Yeah, I also was going to ask Arthur if he had any plans to retain any old assistants. But also, unless I missed it, did you – if you were clear, I'm sorry if I missed it. Are you calling plays or are you not calling plays or is that have, does that have yet to be determined? No, I'm going to call plays. Okay. Is there any, as a follow-up, is um, sometimes when head coaches call plays, sure. they lose sight of the big picture. I'm not saying that's the case here, but sometimes they don't. I mean, do you expect that to sort of be an adjustment or? Well, I mean, here's my, my number one job is a head, head coach of the team. So that's all three phases of every player on the roster. And so it's my job to make sure I coach the entire team. And I understand, you know, there's examples. We talk about history. There's some that have done really well and some that, that haven't been. But, but again, I understand what my job is. And my job is to coach the entire team and also do that to call plays. And there's precedent there that that's, it's been done and been done at a high level. So I'm very confident you hire the right people and it'll be a collaborative effort. And, and my job, like I said, I will coach the entire team. Thank you. Charles right. Davis, 92.9. Hey, Coach. Um, I got a good quick question for you. Uh, what do you subscribe to as far as do you kind of take a look at what you have off um, as a personnel offensively and say, hey, um, I'm going to just try to make an adjustment and try to work with what I have? Or do you try to – or is it a matter of you saying, here's my system and here's what I'm going to run and I'm, I'm going to make sure I have – 
you want to make sure you have um, what you need in order to be able to run what you want to run. Well, there's a lot of factors in there. And we have a foundation, but we're not going to be rigid. And we said, you know, we're going to play to the strength of our roster. And, and in our roster, there's a constant evolution. I mean, the whole thing is you're constantly trying to improve your football team. I'm trying, constantly trying to improve myself as a coach. So we will have a foundation how we want to play up front. And, you know, there's certain core – core beliefs we have in terms of running the football and but we're not going to be rigid we're going to be flexible and adapt and we'll play to the strengths of our roster and again what our roster looks like right now certainly will look different in the coming months and then that, that's that can always change during the season you, you got to adapt because they're they're 100 percent in this in this league there's going to be injuries and that's and we have to adapt to that. and that's what the really good teams do and also, uh, what do you attribute to the, uh, the type of success that, you, uh, that you've had calling plays in the red zone? What do you think that uh, is a part of? Well, we, we, like I said, we, didn't, we tried to spread the ball around. We didn't want to play isolation football, uh, you know, to use a basketball term. And we wanted, we wanted guys, we wanted the ball moving around. We wanted to hit them from a lot of different angles. And we, we, we had good personnel there. And we had a lot of unselfish players. Same message we'll preach to these guys. Follow up from Charles Odom, the AP. Mr. Blank uh, uh, mentioned um, appreciating um, your humility. Uh, this is a sport with a lot of bravado, and sometimes we see that even on the sideline from uh, from people in your position. Uh, how does humility as a coach? Well, it, it's it's a huge factor. I mean, you, you understand that there, it's a competitive business. There's a lot of smart coaches on the side. There's a lot of good players. I certainly will never think I've got all the answers. I think once you do that, I mean, you're you're set up for an epic fail. So I understand that. I appreciate it. We, we got, certainly got confidence. But just understand that as soon as you think you've got all the answers, you're going to get humbled, and this league will humble you quick. Will McFadden, AtlantaFalcons.com. Hey, Coach, you've uh, talked about, you know, adaptability, making your scheme fit the players that you have. If after, um, you know, looking at the roster, evaluating what you have, if you decide or you deem that you need one, how important will it be to go get a workhorse type running back? Somebody that, you know, could carry the load if if they need to get 25, 30 touches a game. Well, there's a lot of ways to do that. So to answer your first question, to be adaptable, if you got two guys, then great. I mean, Cleveland's found success doing that this year. We adapted to Derek. Like I said, there's only one Derek Henry and uh, he's like having Shaquille O'Neal in his prime. And so, you know, you're going to have to feed the big fella. And certainly we did that in Tennessee. And I'm sure that can be different for them. I mean, like I said, every year is different. But that's what, that, that's an example of us playing to our strengths. There's multiple ways to do it. You got two guys, you got three guys. Or if you do find one, I think we have to be flexible. And that's something that Terry and I will map out. And then we'll see what happens this spring and, and what pieces we add or what we use that currently on the roster. Thank you. To Nietzsche Batiste, 92.9. Hey, Coach, congratulations on getting the newest opportunity. You know, I talked to Harry Douglas about this, somebody who is a, has played for both franchises, Falcons and Titans, and he said one thing that stood out to him is you demand toughness on both sides of the ball. You know how to scheme things up, and you use players in the perfect spots, especially on offense. So maybe what's one thing that you would want your players to know when you think about how your former players think about you? Well, it's certainly nice of Harry, and Harry is certainly one of the toughest players I've been around. And, uh, yeah, I just know that we're going to be consistent. We'll be fair, and we're going to hold all these guys accountable. And the best thing we can do is hold our best players accountable. Thanks, Coach. That standard. Thank you.